Heavenly Father, we praise you for this day. What a wonderful gift it is to come together, to sing your praises, to be in fellowship with those of the body of Christ, to declare your word, to hear your word taught, to learn more about what you've done for us. In Jesus Christ, your plan for the ages. We praise you and we thank you for this opportunity and the country which allows us the freedom to study and proclaim your word. And while it does, may we celebrate that freedom with great boldness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Many of us will not be familiar with the name Andres Segovia. Andres Segovia is, for all intents and purposes, the inventor of the modern classical guitar. Not the instrument, but the discipline itself. Guitar was always thought of as sort of a, you know, a, a folk instrument off in the back, not really taken seriously. But Andres Segovia took the, the guitar and turned it into a classical instrument that was now enjoyed and understood the world over. So now as you hear classical guitar, is a very good chance that you're hearing an Andres Segovia recording, even unto this uh, day, because the, the great classic recordings that he made are still a delight to listen to, but additionally, Andrew Fisk and uh, Christopher Parkening and John Williams are all disciples of his in some sense, and every classical guitarist has been impacted by the work and the discipline of Andres Segovia, undoubtedly one of the greatest figures in classical guitar and thereby, I would say, classical modern classical music today. And why I bring him up is that he was able to perform all the way up until very near the end of his life, which as we know, especially as musicians or anything with a high skill profession, as you get older, being precise and being uh, technically magnificent with your fingers and with your extremities and kind of your nerves as you get older, it becomes more and more difficult. And Andres Segovia is really interesting because one of the things he developed was a scale method. So only two pages long in print, but it's said that until the day that he quit playing, until the last day he played guitar, that he would spend an hour a day just running those scales. It's comical because as young student guitar players, it would be difficult for us to motivate ourselves to play scales for five or 10 minutes, but he would spend an hour looking, watching his technique, running up and down the scales, up and down the neck. No joy, no pleasure to listen to, and no fun to play, but because of that constant attachment to the basics, he maintained an incredible level of technical ability and even improved throughout his auto and winter years. He's a remarkable example of what it means to be constantly rooted in the basics. So as we consider this message and Jacob's call back to the basics, I want to note that it's easy for us to get far away from the Lord, even in church. It's easy for us, even though we're here, even though we might be act active and engaged in our faith, to get towards the end and get ahead of ourselves. We start becoming interested in theological issues that are really past our level of theological or biblical learning. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't reach. Please, by all means, reach. But then we start getting dogmatic and, and bent out of shape about issues that we really don't understand the full theological spectrum of. And I think that's because we very frequently get ahead of ourselves and move past, feel as if we're ready to move past the basics when we always benefit to return to those basics. We get a bit out of our depth, or we get excited about things that really are not central to the cause of Christ, his gospel, and his word. And we need that gentle call to return us back to the Lord and the basic things of our faith. And that's what today's passage is about. So as your uh, uh, Bible is undoubtedly open to Genesis 35. We'll start by reading 1 through 4. It says, Then God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel, and dwell there, and make an altar there to God, who appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. And Jacob said to his household and all who were with him, Put away 
your foreign gods that are among you. Purify yourselves and change your garments. Then let us arise and go to be up to Bethel, and I will make an altar there to God, who answered me in the day of my distress and has been with me in the way which I have gone. So they gave Jacob all the foreign gods which were in their hands and the earrings which were in their ears, and Jacob hid them under the terebinth tree which was by Shechem. So God here commands Jacob to return to Bethel. That had already been God's uh, direction that, that he had given him. He told him to go to Bethel. He was intent on going to Bethel, but he'd taken this time uh, to be in Shechem. And we'd seen there'd been some really negative and nasty consequences, as we saw in our last study, that things that impacted his family in ways that no uh, parent would ever want, and then caused his sons to go do, uh, not as an excuse, but just as a cause, caused his sons to go do something horrendous and kill kill the men of an entire village over the incensed nature and the terrible nature of the aggression shown against them by specifically the prince of that village. So it caused some bad situations and now God says it's time to get up. It's time to go back to that place where I first encountered you. He tells him to go back to that place. Now it is interesting to me because we know that God is omnipresent. He is everywhere. Interestingly, we very wrongly call a place like this sometimes a sanctuary, and it's not inappropriate. It is set apart, but it gives the sense that something more holy happens here than might happen in your own bedroom at home or in your own living room or, you know, out on the streets when you share the gospel with someone. And that's false. God is everywhere, and he's not limited to any one place. Certainly. And yet that doesn't change the fact that there are important places for us in our limitation, in our limitations. There might be a place where uh, maybe a childhood church where you per first put your faith in Christ. It might be a place, maybe even just a, a drive that where you had a very uh, important spiritual encounter or impact with the Lord as you were praying, as you were thinking about his word. It might be a, a place up in the mountains or, or when you were camping or it could be any number of things. But there are places that are of importance to us. And I dare say to me, this is one of those places. Knowing all the wonderful things that the Lord has done in my life here at this church, in this building, does bring about the memory of all the good things that he's done. It's not that the place itself is in any way magical or imbued with some sort of special reality of God's presence that he's not present elsewhere. No, nothing like that. But there's something about being in those places that reminds us of all that God has done. And I think that that's a big piece of God calling Jacob back to that place, that, that physical location of their first encounter, of his first encounter with God uh, personally. He tells him to live there. He tells him that he wants him to set up camp there. This is going to be their home base for the time to come. And finally, he orders him to make an altar. Now, the... Uh, Patriarchs have been making altars throughout this, and we've tried to note it each time. Abraham would make altars. Isaac would make altars. It was a, an act of making a place of worship uh, for the, the, the entire community, really, to encounter the Lord. It was an important practice, and it was um, something here, interestingly, that is not done voluntarily. It's done by God's command. So God commands Jacob here, go back to that place, settle down there, and oh, by the way, in case you would forget, make an altar, make a place of public worship between you and me, and between the community and God. So <clears throat> we find that Jacob responds, and he responds well. He goes before his community, the whole group of people, and he gives them the, the rundown. First of all, he says, put away your gods. Now, this is um, an interesting command because we always want to assume that the covenant community would have sort of been purified along the way. But he's right to not take this for granted, and there's at least two reasons. One, we don't know at what point um, Jacob became aware that his wife had stolen the household gods of, of Laban. And it could have been that that was only one of several sort of borrowed pagan practices that continued. But also, what we found in the last chapter is that when the people of Shechem were all murdered by Levi and his brother, 
and Simeon, that they took all the women and children unto themselves. And all of those women and children wouldn't immediately be sanctified, nor would they become believers. In fact, I don't know about you, if someone killed my father and took my mother and, and my three brothers and sisters captive, basically, I might be a little resistant. To, to wanting to obey them. So it makes sense here that he's calling this entire community that now has a bunch of new members with no biblical or no uh, history with the God, uh, Yahweh. It makes sense that he would say, now, now is the time to throw away all your false idols, to throw away all of your false gods. And interestingly, here it says, throw away, it says, throw away their idols and their earrings, which seems a little bit bizarre. And there's uh, two theories, one that I think is a little bit more likely and one slightly less. The less likely is that there was the possibility that people were using earrings as sort of a, a way to worship or identify with a false god or goddess, that they had an idolatrous sense to them. And that's possible. And so he was saying that, that there in this verse refers to the earrings of the people. But I think it's far more likely that we've, because we have found idols that have been given gold earrings, um, and the, the gold earrings were to make or amplify the idol's ability to hear your prayers. And so you can imagine when Jacob said, throw away your idols, that they would say, okay, well, I have to throw away this little stone or wood idol, but I've put some gold earrings on there, so I may as well take those off and, and pocket that, because that's valuable gold. And he's saying, don't. Don't even take that, that stained gold, that gold that has been stained by idolatry, but in fact, put it all away. If it's been attached to an idol or if it is an idol, I want you to remove it entirely. And we'd say, is this some sort of strange you know, legalism or some, some sort of weird overreach? I mean, surely that gold had value. But I believe it could have had a lot to do with the reality that we have memories. And if we were to break, if they were to break that gold off and melt it down and use it for some other purpose, they'd always remember that that was part of their idolatrous life before they came into this relationship with the God of the universe. So he says, put away your gods and the earrings with them. And he says, purify yourselves. Interestingly, now he's going to tell them to do a lot of very physical things. Take a bath. Before the journey, take a bath, cut your hair, get, get yourself ready to go, purify yourself physically and change clothes. Change your clothes, put on different clothes. It, it's another physical way to describe what he wants to be doing spiritually. And it's interesting because we live in this physical world and we do physical things to remind us of what is spiritually or emotionally true. Right? This is what happens when we exchange wedding rings. It's not as if the exchange of rings has any bearing upon how we'll treat one another, but it's a symbol, it's a sign of what we mean to do and mean to, uh, how we mean to regard each other in the future. Baptism, similarly, is an opportunity to do something physical that shows the spiritual reality. And I want to note, because a lot of people get really uh, animated. They say if communion and baptism don't have immediate spiritual value, that is to say that God doesn't give you some sort of magical hocus pocus blessing through it, then it's not worth doing. And that's false. Because the importance of those acts is that it reminds us of all God has already done. And that's what makes it valuable. Because where our eyes of faith are fixed and the things that we do with regularity to remind ourselves are of incredible, in fact, I'd say greater value than the idea that God is somehow dispensing magical blessings to people who do certain rituals. It is more valuable because it keeps our eyes fixed on him as the source of everything that we need for life and godliness. And so here, the um, the the people who have been absorbed into the community of Israel are told to change their clothes and clean themselves off because they're preparing to go to their place and, and we could argue in the long term they're going to preparing to go to worship God Almighty. Now, I want to make just a brief, very brief point. It's something that I never really make issue of and that's that we're in a confused spot in our society. We don't really know how we relate to fine dress any longer. It was in you know, several generations or generations past that everybody would dress nice to come to church because 
hopefully, you wanted to show respect for the other people around you. And most importantly, you wanted to show the utmost respect for the God of the universe. You wanted to put on your best not to impress others, but in order to show that this is how much you respect and look up to and admire this opportunity to worship God, to hear his word. And our society changed. We started to distrust and feel like, are we just showing off for one another? Is it really for God or am I just trying to put on my Sunday best and my pretty Sunday hat in order to impress all the other ladies or gentlemen? And so we kind of bounce back into a very casual view of church. And, and there's something beautiful about that as well, isn't there? The come as you are, that you, if you don't have nice clothes, you shouldn't be in any way ashamed to come and worship with everyone who does. And so I would say for all the confusion and all the possible or potential frustration that we might find in this, I, I like where our church is at. I hope that you put on clean clothes when you come to church on Sunday. Maybe you put on your finest. Maybe you just put on what's appropriate. Please keep everything covered or we'll, we'll throw blankets over you. But <clears throat> I do believe that it is spiritually beneficial to show respect for the place that you're going and the amazing thing that you're doing by dressing nicely. Now, what that means in your context for you and what you have physically, what, you know, not all of us have a three-piece tuxedo. And let me tell you, if you come in a tuxedo, you are going to get some strange looks, rightly so. But <clears throat> what I want to encourage you to do more than anything else, is work this out between you and the Lord. How do you want to present yourself as you come before the God of the universe? He'll take you, and he has taken us, in our sinfulness, in our fallen state. And yet we have the opportunity to show up in a, in a way that shows how much we respect and enjoy what's going on. So we would never, ever, ever make a policy that dictated or even showed an expectation about how we hope people will dress. But I want to invite you to think about how you carry yourself and how you dress yourself as a part of your worship experience. And if that's, if you're at the, a place in your walk with Christ where you need to show up in your shabbiest outdoor work clothes because you need confirmation that the Lord will love you no matter how dirty you are, or how ill-presented you are, you'll find it. If you're ready and you're at a point where you're ready to show respect and love for the body of Christ, to dress up and wear clean, nice clothes as most of us are, do as, oh, let's just say all of us. Because if I say most of us, someone's gonna be thinking, he's singling me out. I'm not. <laughs> I really don't care what you wear. I care about your relationship with the Lord. So um, might I challenge you to think just a little bit about what you wear when you come to worship the Lord as in a part of that worship. <clears throat> and then we're told why, uh, why that he will go. It's because the Lord called them. They would go because the Lord had called them to do this. And that's what this is uh, ultimately about. It's an act of obedience to the Lord. So we move on to verses 5 through 8, which read, And they journeyed, and the terror of God was upon the cities and were all around them. And they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. So Jacob came to Luz, that is Bethel, which is in the land of Canaan. He and all the people who were with him, and he built an altar there and called the place El Bethel. Because there God appeared to him when he fled from the face of his brother. So now they make the big move. Remember that Jacob was scared, was frustrated with Simeon and Levi. He said, you, you made me obnoxious. You made me a stench in the nose of the people around because he did just by killing this entire village of men and taking all the women and all the animals and children captive, they had essentially sh showed that they were not a peaceful people. They were a people of violent and, and violence and they were a threat to anyone around them especially within the culture that day, as tragic as it is, they would have viewed the transgression against Dinah as being normal, as being not certainly not worthy of killing even one person, much less many. Now, of course, God's morality disagrees, but that didn't change the reality that everybody around would be threatened and terrified, uh, potentially, of them, or worse yet, banded together 
to destroy them. And yet what we see is that God brings, what we see is the terror of God falling on these people. Now, a good part of that is going to be because two guys went and killed an entire village worth of men. If they didn't have the whole story about them uh, preying upon their weakness after agreeing to, to circumcision and joining the community and the treacherous nature of this, then they would say that uh, it was pretty amazing that two guys could take on and destroy an entire village. However, even if they knew the reality that these people are resourceful and crafty would have made them terrifying as well. And so God seemed to encourage that attitude within each of these places, just not to pick on them, not to mess with Israel, so that they had a safe journey going forward. Because whatever it was, it wasn't worth risking so long as they weren't settling down next to you and your family. And so that protected them in this journey with which very well could have been another military conflict uh, coming up on them. And it said that he built an altar there. We want to just talk about this business of altar building because it's something we might take for granted. It wouldn't probably look as, as keen as, and nice as this. But we see that God meets us in space and time. He's not limited by space and time. But he meets us in a, in a place. Because you're always in a place. In a time. Because you're always... In a time, God meets us where we're at, though he's not limited by that at all. And he asks here, Jacob, and this has been obviously handed down because all the patriarchs did this prior to that, to build an altar. And when we think about building an altar, I want to remind you that it's not a small amount of work. You're taking the stones, you're building and are digging up and carrying, heaving very big, heavy stones to place them on one another so that you have a surface that is acceptable to make a sacrifice. You have a table high enough to kill and bleed out and then burn an animal that would be undoubtedly understood as paying for your sin, as standing in as your substitute, as an altar, as the altar of God, making the uh, connection between God and man possible once again, taking care of the sin debt and remedying the problem even temporarily in the case of these altars. That's what an altar is for. That's why they would build these altars. Surely God encountered people apart from altars and encountered Jacob and spoke to Jacob many times and there's no mention of any sacrifice at play. But when it came to him wanting to make a permanent relationship and a permanent stand at a place, he said, make an altar. I want you to be making sacrifices because I don't want you to forget for a single moment that sacrifice is necessary, that blood must be shed to pay the sin debt and repair the relationship between man and God. And every one of those altars, every one of those sacrifices would be reminding them of the seed to come, the Messiah who would come. You see, we don't build altars any longer and we're not meant to. Some churches uh, in a rather confused manner, we'll call this table here the altar and even have an altar call. But no sacrifice is made on this table in any church throughout the world that I know of. I mean, there might be some crazy church out there that cuts up a chicken on the front table every morning. I've never been to it. I'm not really keen to go. But the reality is that no sacrifice takes place on that. That's not an altar. That's our communion table. We don't make altars anymore. Because our sacrifice has been made. And while there's no altar for you to make, there's room at the cross for you. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 5 says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. That simple gospel holds the reality that you need not build an altar because Jesus Christ went to the cross, was crucified, and paid the penalty for your sins with his blood and his life, was buried and raised again on the third day so that you and I might know permanent and perfect forgiveness. And never again need fear the condemnation and judgment or wrath of God. So this calling of Jacob back to build an altar 
to find a blood sacrifice through which he could meet righteously and justly meet the God of the universe is a poignant example of our daily need to come back to the foot of the cross of Christ and remember that no matter how mature, how far along we've come, it is still by the grace of God and the grace of God alone that we have been saved through faith. And that gift is not of ourselves. It's his working. It's his doing. It's to his glory. And the moment we forget that and think that there's something in us that we're bringing to the, this equation, something in us that is praiseworthy or, or uh, uplifts us, is the moment that we fall into spiritual arrogance and walk by, the by our sin nature and experience the loss that comes thereof. Well, at this point, God shows up. 9 through 15 reads, it says, Then God appeared to Jacob again when he came to Padan, from Padan Aram and blessed him. And God said to him, Your name is Jacob. Your name shall not be called Jacob anymore, but Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel. And God, also God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall proceed from you. And kings shall come from your body. The land which I gave Abraham and Isaac I give to you and to your descendants after you I give this land. Then God went up from him in the place where he talked with him. So Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he talked to him, a pillar of stone, and he poured a drink offering on it and poured oil on it. And Jacob called the name of the place where God spoke with him, Bethel. So God does something interesting here and reiterates the renaming. Uh, some people have thought that this is because of kind of inaccuracies and unnecessary repetitions in the text, or possibly the fact that actually what we very likely believe to be true is that Moses was dealing with various different ancient sources that had been handed down to him through the uh, line and the histories of Israel. And as he was compiling many of them, there might have been repetition within them. I don't tend to think that's the case here. I tend to think that this repetition is not... Um, parenthetical or not textual in nature. I think that it is God saying, remember when that happened? Not many day or not many months ago, maybe years, but not likely. I changed your name to Israel and I meant it. And it, it's an important little side note is that we have a new identity in Christ as well. I, 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 or John, <laughs> Jacob is given a new identity here to be one that means both uh, and sounds like prince of God, one who rules with God, and also uh, sounds like one that wrestles with God. And that name was meant to characterize his life and his mission going forward. And yet it seems that from God's perspective that he had forgotten that or at least could use a reminder. And so it is with us. As a believer in Jesus Christ today, you have a new identity. You are no longer identified with your sins, with your uh, sin nature, with what you've done in the past or will do in the future. You're no longer identified with the destiny of Adam and all that we were born into. You are now in Christ. And that the chorus is repeated again and again and again throughout the New Testament. You are in Christ. You are in him. You are in the beloved. When God looks at you, he sees Jesus Christ. He no longer sees your history. He sees Christ's history, his perfect history and spotless, blameless righteousness surrounding you at all times. Don't forget it. Because the reality of biblical Christianity is not earn, work for, and get, and then you'll become a mature Christian. It is accept the grace gift of God. He's made you now whole and complete in Christ. Now just go act like who you are. Go be who he's made you to be. Rest in the perfect provision which he's given for you. Why does he reiterate the renaming for Jacob? Because Jacob needed that reminder. And he reiterates it for us over and over and over again in the word that when God looks at you, he no longer sees you if you're a believer today. He sees the perfect work of Jesus Christ. Lest we forget it, may we be reminded regularly as we go to read the, our Bibles, as we listen to the uh, reiteration of the Spirit through our lives and through the church. God then identifies himself in the situation. And this is important. He says, uh, your name is Jacob. 
and Jacob shall not be your name anymore, but Israel shall be your name. And he calls his name Israel. He said, I am God Almighty. And in this situation, God is bringing out the reality of his omnipotence. The fact that there is nothing that is beyond his power or his authority to do. And God identifies himself as such because this is the characteristic or trait that Jacob would need to understand the command that was yet to follow. So he says, be fruitful and multiply. It's interesting that in any situation wherein a, a a group of people or a people group is in distress or in danger, one of the things that just very naturally occurs is they stop, this is populations of humans and animals, they stop having quite so many babies. Because they're not sure that there's going to be enough resources to do so. Or they're in danger and they worry that the, there's a war or there's some other external stimuli keeping them from wanting to uh, act boldly and, and certainly grow their families by having more children. And yet here God says, on account of the fact that I am God Almighty, you can freely go about and do what I have had for you to do, which is to be fruitful and multiply. He wants him to have more children and continue to expand in terms of their genetic people group. Now this command was get considered as part of the law for, uh, for Israel. In fact, uh, that's why it was expected that unless you, in Jewish culture, unless you were going on some sort of holy or spiritual mission, that you would, of course, get married and have children. That was obeying God's command. Uh, it's, uh, not, we're not under the law today. However, I would say it is a wonderful thing. We are also free to be fruitful and to multiply, to have children, to have grandchildren. That is a wonderful gift of God. It's the way that God made us to be. And I would argue that it's not just in the physical sense, but in the spiritual sense. You are free to be fruitful and multiply. God Almighty overlooks your mission. So whatever might scare you or keep you from sharing your faith, from sharing the gospel with another, be fearful no more. Because the God Almighty who told Jacob here, be fruitful and multiply, has also told you through his word to go unto all nations and preach the gospel to every creature. And you don't need to be afraid because he is omnipotent. He is all powerful and will never be caught off guard in any sense. And then he reiterates the covenant here. He reiterates the covenant to him, promising him land, seed, and blessing. We'll come back to that in a moment. And he rebuilds the stela. He rebuilds this, uh, um, this uh, post. You think of it as a large rock that's turned up on its side. He anoints it again, sanctifying it. This is a way of separating it, saying this is a unique rock. This is a unique place. Something special happened here. He wasn't saying that the rock was magical. He was marking it as a place where something remarkable had occurred. And no one could argue that the reality that God appearing to someone and directly revealing information is a remarkable reality indeed. So I just want to um, note, going, jumping back to the covenant, you have a chart. I don't have it up here, uh, but you have a chart in your handout showing that, again, reiteration of this promise. The promise had been made to Abraham that God would unconditionally provide him with land for his people. That would be the land of Canaan or the land of Israel, we'd say. A seed that is an abundant progeny, people to follow him. And finally, the seed, that is the seed of the Messiah that would come forth. And blessing, that God would bless those who bless and curse those who curse Israel. And through the nation of Israel, all the nations of the world will be blessed. And I want to note that of those three elements of that promise, not one of them is fulfilled at this moment. God has shown his faithfulness in every regard and every promise, but in this great covenant that has been repeated again and again and again in Genesis. And I hope if you've taken one thing from this study that God is so passionate about this promise that he keeps repeating it and repeating it, saying, I am going to fulfill this. Wait upon me. Do not wonder. Do not begin to question whether or not I meant what I said. And do not begin to question whether or not I'm capable of doing what I said I'm going to do. And so we can see how these promises have been, uh, or the early stages of the preparation, we might say, for their fulfillment is in place. 
Israel sits, not within the full land that they've been given, but there they are in the land to this day. I won't tell you that that is a guarantee that God's prophetic plan is moving today, but it certainly means that whenever the Lord chooses to commence his plan at the rapture, that everything will be ready to go. Can you imagine believers reading earlier in, you know, in the 1800s when Israel was not even in the land and saying, God says it's going to happen. And they were there. They didn't know what would happen in 1940. They didn't know that God would uh, prepare his people to return to their place, which he'd given them. The land, the seed we've seen that Jesus Christ came and, um, and, and paid the price for sin. But as we see in the explanation of those three promises throughout the Bible, that there's more just than his payment for sin in this promise. And what the, the covenant that God made with David promised that the Messiah would come and rule and reign as king and kings and lord of lords on this earth. That is what the Jews expected. That is what Jesus never corrected them on. He corrected them on their expectation of him. They didn't like him because he didn't just applaud them and their self-righteousness and their control of others. That's why they rejected him because he asked them to come to God. They wanted a God who would see them as being perfect and righteous and give them more power. So this covenant is still our hope to this day. Finally, that promise of blessing, we could argue and see how even America has been blessed immensely. And no small part of that, I believe, without shadow of a doubt, is that we have been a friend to the Jews, to the nation of Israel. There's no question in my mind that in spite of all of our grotesque rejection of God and all the sad ways in which we continue to move further away from him, as long as we're a friend of Israel, I believe that there will be some preservative blessing based on the words of this promise. We could also argue that the world has been blessed manifoldly <laughs> by the nation of Israel in medical uh, and philosophical advancements, academic advancements, and even our view of history in the world that has caused us or given us the ability to move forward and, and progress in this world all comes from a Jewish view of history that God created things that they make sense and that we can figure them out and we can improve them until he returns. All of those things are gifts for the Jews that through which he blessed all the nations. Furthermore, the gospel of Christ has blessed every tongue and every people and every nation with the opportunity to be restored to God and forgiven sin. So we could say that all of these things have, have had shadows of fulfillment. But I tell you, without a moment of doubt, that there is a future hope ahead, a final fulfillment that will go on into eternity when Jesus Christ returns and sits on the throne of David for a thousand years, when this entire world explodes forth in health and prosperity, when lifespans are again increased beyond what we could even imagine today, when health and freedom and oppression are our reign and oppression is gone forever. There's a world that will be blessed eternally and restored eternally when Jesus Christ returns. At that point, this promise to Abraham will be fulfilled. This covenant, this promise to Abraham is an overarching summary of God's plan for history. And we sit right in the middle, well, I might argue, right towards the end, right at that exciting moment. As a child, we can get excited about Christmas, July, September, October, but when you get to December 23rd, December 20th, oh, the anticipation builds. Brothers and sisters, that's where you sit. We're right here somewhere in mid-December, awaiting the Lord's next step in his plan to come for us and to fulfill every promise that he's had, both to judge evil, call the world back to himself, and reign. And you and I will see a restored and perfected world and a society filled with the life and love and peace and righteousness where wrong is immediately and justly dealt with and cut off and where righteousness and freedom is allowed to reign forever. That's what's ahead for us. That's why this promise is reiterated again and again and again. 
so that Jacob could personally be assured and so that we can be assured that the place we're going is better than the place that we are. And hopefully that will give us the impetus that we need to never fall in love with the place that we are because we know it falls short of the place that we're heading. Never settle for less than God's best. Never become at home in this, the shadow lands of all of God's blessing. So in closing our study today, I'll ask you, is it a good time to get back to basics in your life? Is it a good time to go back to the beginning? Either physically or probably what's more likely in your internal spiritual being. To go back to the time, if you have such a singular time, the moment when you truly trusted in Jesus Christ. The moment when you remember you put faith, or even if you don't remember that moment, going back to the central reality of your faith in Christ. It's always a good time to do that. It's why we celebrate the Lord's table. So you can go back at least once a month. It's why we mention it so often in sermons, because you need to go back to that reality that your relationship with Jesus Christ, where he saved you by grace through faith, is at the very core of your life moving forward. And the source of all that he has for you to do and to be. Is it a good time to go back to that beginning? Of course. Change your clothes. As these people here change their clothes in preparation for this new thing. Getting rid of those uh, foreign gods. But changing their clothes. I would like to use. Again, this is not what Genesis is saying. This is just a, a picture for us. We're using this as a word picture. For the idea. You have... Do you have sin that's crept into your life? Have you been walking by means of the flesh enough to, to draw you away? Because there's those sins of pattern that can be so insidious. Even in a Christian's life where we allow them or we tolerate them or we say everyone else is doing them or however it is that we justify it. And it can just slowly, ever so slightly be drawing us away from our fellowship with Christ and bring about a settled coldness in our walk with Jesus that can, that can be devastating. And it's the worst thing because it's just like hypothermia. You don't feel the onset. You slowly move further further away. Is it time for a change of clothes? Is it time to recognize those sins or those attitudes, those actions, those relationships that you've let sin creep into and just change that out to confess that you're out of line and let the Lord and his perfect forgiveness in again. Is it time to let go of your foreign gods? There are so many foreign gods that can come in. It could be your favorite news network that you look to, whether, don't care which one it is. You can look to that and, and try to de derive some sense of being right or being informed or being strong or being whatever it is. Perhaps your favorite political party or leader that you'd love to look up to or to whom you love to look up and say, that's where the hope is. If this person were only, if that person were only, then, oh, we just have to keep trusting in leader A or leader B, whether you like that guy or not. No political party is worthy or person, leader, is worthy of the faith that is worthy only and due only to Christ. Some philosophy, some way of thinking, new age or otherwise thing that you've allowed to creep into your faith and said, well, Jesus just isn't doing it for me anymore. I need a little bit more of this uh, positivism or this you know, uh, peaceful meditation or whatever it is. Is there something that's crept into your life that's drawing you away from Christ? A new drug, a new way of trying to cope with reality through something that you eat, something you drink, or a pill that you take. A new hobby that you've used to divert yourself and distract yourself from your ultimate relationship with Christ or a habit that's crept in. Is it, it is time to let go of those foreign gods. They come in so easily to all of our lives. And it's a good day today to say, you know what? That really is, has become an idol in my life and I need to set it aside today to worship Christ and go to the cross. It's time to take it all back to the cross. You see, the cross of Jesus Christ, his death for us, our identification with him and death, burial, resurrection, ascension and seating is not just the milk of our faith, it is the meat. 
It is by faith in that sacrifice that you will live every moment until you're face to face with him. And when you're face to face with him and made perfect and made righteous and made holy before him, in your position and your condition alike, when you stand face to face with him and have all the, sin, the presence of the sin nature and all sin and even the desire for some sin has been removed from you, it will be because of the cross of Jesus Christ upon which you trusted during your life. It is that one simple act of God on this earth that is meant to dictate everything about your internal and external life while you walk on this planet. You'll never go wrong. Just take your thoughts back to the forgiveness given on the cross. Let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the example of Jacob. That in the complexity of his growing success and strength, even in the face of adversity, you called him back to the place where you first encountered him. You called him back to trust that it was you who chose him and you and your sovereign hand that would see your will done in his life that would tr let him to trust in the promises which you gave him the results of which he wouldn't see in that physical life and so I pray Lord give us that same wisdom for we lack it let us return to the basics your death for us on the cross your provision through your word, through your spirit, through your church, through our access to you in prayer. Oh, Lord God, give us the wisdom to return to the foot of the cross, to trust you and continue to trust you with every aspect of our life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.